Welcome everybody from across Texas. It's really exciting to have you on today. Um, welcome to Plant Party. Today our theme is, what's that? Plant Party for everyone. Plant Party is hosted by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Texas A&M, AgriLife Extension Service, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Funding for the programs provided by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. Plant Party is a quarterly webinar series intended for advanced plant training and fun education. I'm Megan Clayton, Professor and Extension Range Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. My co-hosts are Tim Sigmund, the Private Lands Program Leader with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and Charles Kniper, State Resource Conservationist with USDA NRCS. We have 32 wonderful door prizes we'll be giving away today. I'd like to thank Bamert Seed, Bear Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, Douglas King Seed, Native American Seed, Pogue Agri Partners, Renewable Resources Extension Act, Texas Brigades, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for donating these neat prizes. Yes, Megan, and let's get some housekeeping out of the way. We'll be moving quickly through five presentations today. Please feel free to type in your questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll be able to answer them privately to you through that box. We'll be sharing the link to the recorded webinar as soon as possible to all registered participants, but not the actual presentation, so be sure to take notes. Thanks for that intro, Charles. So our first presenter today is Stephen Evans. Mr. Evans was raised on ranches in Southwest Texas. He received his BS degree from Texas A&M University in Rangeland Ecology and Management with an emphasis in wildlife science. He received his MS degree from Colorado State University in Rangeland Science with an emphasis in wildlife biology and riparian management. He then managed ranches in Southwest Texas for over 21 years and additionally was an instructor for nine years of the wildlife management program at SWTJC in Uvalde, Texas. Currently, he serves on the faculty at Texas A&M University in College Station within the Rangeland, Wildlife, and Fisheries Department. He instructs courses in rangeland ecology, vegetation management, range inventory and monitoring, rangeland vegetation sampling, and range planning. He currently serves on the AgriLife Herbicide Use Committee, Range Science Education Council, and on the Board of the Directors for the Texas Section for the Society of Range Management. Stephen's presentation today is Major Clumping, the Value of Grouping Plants by Common Characteristics. Thanks for kicking off our party, Stephen. Well, good morning, everyone. First, I wanna thank Dr. Clayton for putting this plant party together. And I also wanna thank her for my invitation to speak at the party today. I wanna to apologize for not being able to give this presentation live, but I have a regularly scheduled class I teach at this time on Wednesdays. So since we only have 15 minutes, let's go ahead and jump into our first topic. This first session we titled Major Clumping, the Value of Grouping Plants by Common Characteristics. I find myself many times when walking through a pasture and when seeing a, a plant I don't know the name of and want to know more about, I get drawn into the identification process to find out the species name of that plant. I think we all enjoy that process of identifying plants to the species level and understand the value of doing that for us to even be here today at the party. I would like us though to take a step back now just for a moment and look at plants in the bigger picture. So what is this bigger picture? And as the title suggests, that is grouping of plants by common characteristics and discussing any value of just identifying plants to that level. So I'd first like to take a couple of minutes to look at some examples of different ways we group plants and the reasoning behind those groupings. We've been grouping plants in the field of range management for quite some time now. One of the most familiar plant groupings comes from Dr. E.J. Dykstra Heist in 1949 where he grouped plants based on their response to grazing. These plant groupings include our decreasers, increasers, and invader plants in relation to grazing pressure, and the relative abundance of these plant groups was used by Dr. Dykstra Heist to evaluate and classify range sites. Some other examples of how we have grouped plants on rangelands include our cool season versus warm season plants based on their photosynthetic pathways being either C3 or C4 pathways. And this correlates into not only their season of growth, but also differences in their nutritional quality in terms of digestibility. Tree and brush species are many times grouped as either root sprouters, such as mesquite or wee 
or non-root sprouters, such as ash juniper. And that is based on the response to plant top removal. And these groupings are used to help determine control methods for these plant groups. Another familiar way we group plants is by their common nutritional characteristics that contribute to a specific animal species nutrition, such as warm season perennial grasses for cattle. Many of our plant groupings we refer to as functional groups. So we can ask the question, do certain plants all function alike related to a disturbance or a management practice when we are determining what, a group, what group a specific plant will fall into? These examples of plant groupings we've mentioned up to this point are based upon their common physiology, nutritional characteristics, response to disturbance, etc. Uh, so now I would like to discuss plant grouping based on physical or morphological characteristics. I would like to focus today on plant grouping that is what is one of our most basic and straightforward grouping systems of plants, but I consider it to be very beneficial in evaluating land for livestock and wildlife production, and is also valuable in the process of plant ID to the species level. This grouping is simply to place most of our plants we encounter on a site into the three groups of either woody plants, grasses and grass likes, and forbs based on their physical characteristics. So let's go ahead and define those three groups. So our woody plants, and these definitions I have on these slides are from the Society for Range Management out of, out of their glossary. And our woody plants is a term used in reference to trees, shrubs, or browse that characteristically contain persistent ligneous material. So these have a, typically have a trunk, they're thicker, stiffer material, mostly larger in size when mature than our other two groups we'll talk about our grasses and our forbs and browse is a component of this this woody group and that is the part of shrubs woody vines and trees available for animal consumption and it's particularly the leaves and the new leaves and new stem tips that are highly digestible that browsers are seeking out our next group are our forbs and they are defined as any broad-leafed herbaceous plant other than those in the uh, Poaceae, Cyperaceae, and Juncaceae families. So other than our grasses and, and sedges and rush species. So they have a uh, net vein broadleaf, typically have large showy flowers and non-woody stems. Now something to note here is that in our woody component we have some plants that look a whole lot like uh, forb sometimes. Um, uh, suffrutescent growth form is how they're uh, described and that is they have a woody base with a flexible stem uh, and so they have a stems like forbs that flex but have a woody base like a woody uh, plant and therefore they are classified uh, as shrubs a lot of times we refer to those as woody forbs though so our last group here are our grasses, and they're members of the grass family Poaceae, and their characteristics, they're also non-woody plants, don't have that stiff ligneous structure to them. They have leaves with parallel veins as compared to our net vein leaves of our woody plants and our, our forbs, and they have small non-showy flowers and overall just a lot smaller parts and pieces, making them a little harder to identify when when looking at those characteristics since they are so small. And then our grass likes. Uh, so these are our, again, our, our sedges and rushes that are similar in appearance to grasses. So those are our basic three groups. However, we can pull out other groups in the landscape, such as our succulents, for example. Now, while these plant groups are based on physical characteristics, they also have some other characteristics associated with them, such as those related to nutrition, and therefore different values as food for different animal species. So while we'll be focusing on their physical commonalities, there are other commonalities we can think about in terms of management of these plant groups. So for the rest of the talk, when I mention plant groups, I'll be referring to these three. So here's what I believe to be the value here of grouping plants into woody plants, grasses, and forbs, and looking at the bigger, bigger picture. That big picture will allow us to look at the landscape related to these major plant groupings in terms of their relative abundance and arrangement across that landscape. 
So we can do that as we have here a bird's eye view and off off the side of a of a of a hill and then we have a bird's eye view um, looking down uh, either via satellite or drone photo so I believe this is a great place to start in, in getting this big pictures through these bird's eye views such as with satellite or drone photos and also assessing a landscape from this broader perspective as we step out onto the property on a property for the first time. So one, we can look at the relative abundance or the amount of certain attributes of these groups, such as biomass or canopy cover that is taken up by each of our three plant groupings. And most often we look at this from the perspective of plant cover, particularly when viewing from some type of aerial photo. And two, we can look at this at the spatial arrangement of these groups across the landscape. We have different tools that we can use to measure and quantify this abundance and arrangement of our plant groups that we use along with our observations. These tools can be used on the ground or from these aerial views. One tool we can use to look from this perspective is one that can help us delineate these plant groupings on a map. So as an example, This is a map of a portion of the Sonora Station that shows relative abundance and the spatial arrangement of our woody plant cover relative to our herbaceous plant cover. So what was, was done on this map was the woody plants and the herbaceous cover was delineated along with some other type of cover. So here we have green representing our woody plant cover, which consists primarily of ash juniper, oak species and some other species uh, such as, as agarito. And then our yellow is our herbaceous plant cover, the more open areas with our grasses and, and more of our forb uh, production in those areas. And then the blue is our other where we have uh, roads and, and caliche pads, oil uh, gas pads that are represented by the blue color. And we realize there are some grasses and forbs within some of our woody cover and some small woody cover in our herbaceous areas. I think as our technology develops, there's a tremendous potential to improve differentiating plant groups in a pasture setting, utilizing these GIS tools. And there is some currently some really great work being done in this area. So taking this information, we can utilize it to look at animal production based on how animals will interact with that landscape to meet their needs. We can look through the perspective of the animals we are managing for, cattle or white-tailed deer, for example. We can then apply this information about our plant groups to the habitat requirement for the species we are managing for. One way we can evaluate a landscape is to compare diet value for specific animal species related to these three groups. Each of these three groups are different related uh, to relative fiber content and therefore digestibility of the plant parts that are chosen with animal diets. Once we have assessed an area in terms of these plant groups, we can use this information to match animals to the available plant groups. For example, if we're managing for primarily browsers such as white-tailed deer and have the landscape dominated by a diverse woody plant group, then we have the foundation that can provide a focus of their food throughout the year and also provide thermal and screening cover, but we also may be lacking in the forb group in terms of the amount that white-tailed deer would prefer to have in their habitat. We can then look at ways to increase that forb group in the landscape. This is also where understanding the spatial arrangement of these plant groups is also important. In terms of evaluating habitat for wildlife species such as white-tailed deer and then exploring ways to make changes to the spatial arrangement if deemed necessary. Within our many ruminant species of both livestock and wildlife, as you can see on, on this table here, we have that we have on rangelands in Texas, there are differences in what diets they select based on digestive morphology and physiology. They can concentrate on these different plant groupings when seeking out their diet. So a knowledge of what plant group or groups an animal is seeking out and what amounts of these groups are available in terms of the relative abundance and arrangement can help us understand how animals will be interacting with that landscape and can help us match animal diet with food resources to more efficiently harvest the energy and nutrients from that landscape. Therefore, these plant groupings become important when considering multi-species livestock grazing and designing a grazing plan for them. We can also monitor utilization of plant communities by herbivores. 
by monitoring plant groups. For example, in our woody plant component, we can assess browse utilization by white-tailed deer and or other browsers present to help us understand the amount of pressure being placed on that portion of the habitat. So, for example, we can see a bite from uh, a browse species, kidney wood, over on that right photo. And we can also assess grass utilization by grazers such as cattle or bison to determine management decisions such as length and timing of our grass group rest period uh, that, that is needed, showing that grazing utilization there on that left photo of our grasses in that, that plant group that relates to our grazers. And this brings me to what we're focused on today at our plant party, plant ID. And I believe the value of looking at plants in terms of woody plants, grasses, and forbs is the first step in identifying plants to the species level. In plant ID, we are keying out plants, for example, in a, in a, in a book, we are just breaking down plants into categories with similar characteristics, those physical and morphological characteristics, such as we've done to place plants in our three groups we focused on today. So immediately, we eliminate groups of plants as possibilities by being able to place plants into these groups or categories, and that's really what plant ID entails, using the process of elimination in a dichotomous key, for example, until the correct plant is left, and then verifying it really is the plant that we ended up with when keying out. So assigning an individual plant to one of our groups is the first step in that process of elimination and moves us pretty quickly through that identification process as we assign plants to these different groups and narrow our choices down. Within these groups, our grasses are grass-like, for example. As we're out in the pasture, we may notice one species being dominant in terms of percent composition of cover or biomass, for example, in that plant group. We may not know the species name at this point, but we can see that in terms of relative abundance, it makes up a lot of the grass group in our plant community. This gives us the justification and motivation to ID this plant to the species level. So why? We need to know more about this plant as it relates to our management goals and objectives. It could be one that is going to help us meet them or one that might be holding us back somehow. We can then look at the value of that species as it relates to our management goals, and we can start making a decision on relative abundance of that plant in the plant community. So how much do we want? So in summary, I believe there is a real benefit to management when we group plants by their common characteristics, whether it be by how they function as a group or their common physical structure. And these benefits range from understanding large scale management factors related to livestock and wildlife management to speeding up the plant ID process on the sites we are managing, as well as more effective way to communicate about plants and management than uh, if we only use taxonomic groups. So with that, I again want to thank Dr. Clayton and I'll close out this session. Thank you. So we'd like to thank <clears throat> Stephen there for that presentation. He was able to record for us since he wasn't able to be here today. Um, and so our next presentation uh, here as we move on will be from Maddie Mil Milner. Uh, Maddie is the state NRCS rangeland management specialist for Texas NRCS. She started in this position in July of 2021, working alongside the other state technical discipline leads to provide guidance on technical planning on grazing lands to field staff for NRCS. Before coming to Texas, Madeline served as the area range specialist for NRCS in Southern California. During her time there, she worked with a wide variety of producers from large cattle ranches in the Central Valley to urban farms in Compton. She worked on a variety of large, large scale projects involving wildfire prevention and recovery, mitigating for extreme doubt and water adjudication, and habitat corridor projects for threatened and endangered species. She was a member of the California Pacific, Pacific Section of the Range Society for Range Management and the Los Angeles County Cattlemen's Association. We now look forward to her being a part of our Texas sections. And just as a reminder to everyone, can, uh, we ask that if you have any questions, to please type them into the question and answering box. So with that, we'd like to welcome Maddie for her presentation, Perennial versus Annual Forbes, and you can take it away. Hi, I'm Madeline Milner. You can call me Maddie. And um, like Tim said, I work for the Natural Resource Conservation Service here in Texas. And today I'm going to be talking to you about perennial and versus annual forbs and some ways that you can tell the difference. 
So why do we want to be able to tell the difference between these life cycles? Well, in general, being able to identify the plant species that are on our properties can help land managers or landowners monitor whether the changes on the rangeland or the forest are moving towards our goals or away from them. Monitoring our plants in a way that informs our decisions allows us to make changes in real time and adapt our strategies throughout a year or throughout a growing season so that we can make changes and get back on course towards our objectives. And to do that, it's important to be able to accurately identify our important plant species so that we can have the fastest reaction time possible. And um, realistically, most of us are probably not gonna be able to memorize and instantly recall the 200 plus plant species or more that might appear in our counties by their family, genus, and species. And um, I'm really excited to follow the first presentation and talking about sort of grouping uh, because it's easier to learn how to identify our plants by first learning how we can group them together into communities. So uh, when we start with plant classification, these are some of the ways that the range plants are typically grouped. There is um, origin, which is the area where that plant developed and evolved. Knowing the origin of a plant is important because it affects the way the plant will respond to its environment. Rangeland plants are typically categorized as either native or introduced. Um, native plants originated where they now occur without the help of humans and are typically better adapted to the local climate, soils, and grazing animals and wildlife animals than an introduced uh, plant. An introduced plant is occurring outside of their natural home range and typically have been introduced by humans, either on purpose or by accident. Uh, lifespan is what we're going to be talking about today. The lifespan of a plant refers to the length of time from the germination and sprouting of that plant to its natural death. Uh, in other words, this is how long it takes the plant to grow, flower, make seeds, and then die. And the growth form, which we're also going to be talking about a bit, is the physical form and any external structures of the plant. So we'll start with talking about what a perennial life cycle means. Um, Perennial plants, oh, excuse me, if a plant grows from the previous year's growth from roots in the case of a herbaceous plant or from the buds and stems on a shrub or a woody plant or like a tree, then that means it's a perennial plant. When we're talking about most rangeland plants, we usually have three different life cycles, which is perennial, annual, and then sometimes biennial which means two years versus one. Typically biennials are sort of grouped in management wise with annual plants. Most native rangeland plants fall into the perennial category, unless you start getting out into like the Southwest or Western United States where you see a lot more of the uh, issues with introduced annual grasses becoming dominant. Uh, perennial plants will typically put a lot of their energy into the growth efforts of their roots and their current year's vegetation. And then sort of next in priority is going to be flowers and producing seeds. The first spring of the plant's life, it will germinate and have its first flower in the summer where it'll drop its seed. During the fall, it will build up root reserves so that it can go dormant in the winter time. The second spring of that plant's life, it will grow from the root and then again flower and produce seeds in the summer and go dormant again in the winter. And that cycle continues until the plant eventually dies. So depending on the plant species, that can be three years, five years, 10 years, or even 100 years. You know, we've all heard of these trees, which are perennial, which can live for a very, very long time. Annual plants um, is referring to a life cycle where a plant grows from a seed rather than from roots or from buds every year and will only live for one season. That means it is a, an annual plant. Annual plants will typically put all of their efforts into that one year of life and to producing their flowers and making seeds. They usually make a really high volume of seeds and that's why annual communities can be very resilient long-term despite having a short life cycle. They can only reproduce by seed. And in this chart, it shows the life cycle of a winter annual, which will germinate in the fall, go dormant throughout the winter to survive those like frost periods, and that will grow and produce its seed in the spring to fully die off by the summer. 
um, in the annual life cycle, you will have the winter annual, and then you'll also have a summer annual. And it basically happens in reverse. The germination occurs in the spring. The plant has its period of growth and flowering throughout the summer, produces seeds in the fall, and then completely dies off before the winter. And now that we've covered the two life cycles, we're gonna take a look at the morphology of the major plant growth forms on rangelands. We're gonna cover all of them and then we're gonna focus on forbs. So growth form is probably the easiest way to start identifying um, and classifying your plants. I think most of us are probably broad, familiar with those broad categories of grasses, trees, shrubs, without having to take a plant ID course. So when you start identifying your range plants, you can automatically start suiting, sorting them into one of these major groups. And so I wanna briefly review some of the characteristics of the major four. So grasses have hollow jointed stems that are herbaceous, parallel veining in the stems and the leaves and fibrous roots. They don't produce colored flowers and their seeds are often grain-like. A grass-like plant, such as a sedge or rush, will look like a grass, but they don't have hollowed stems. They have solid stems without the jointing. And um, that is an important difference. But if you're often walking in the field, if you just sort of take a look at the herbaceous body and the parallel veining, it can be easy to assume that a grass-like is the same as a grass, which it, which it isn't. Shrubs are woody plants that will regrow leaves and flowers on the same stems year after year. They typically have broad leaves and produce seeds and berries. Uh, shrubs, as opposed to trees, will have multiple main stems instead of the one main trunk that everybody probably visualizes if somebody tells you to picture a tree in your mind. And then finally getting on to forbs, the focus of our discussion today, if that is the category that includes most wildflowers and the plants that are commonly referred to as weeds or invasives. Their stems are solid, unlike grasses, but they are not quite woody like a shrub. So forbs are herbaceous and they produce showy flowers that can appear in a variety of colors. Their veining in the leaves is typically netted. Um, they have non-woody stems, but that are solid and a mature certain species, especially perennial forbs. They can feel or even appear very woody because of how strong they are, but they are not technically woody as in like a shrub. Um, most forbs, especially perennial forbs, will form a taproot. Forbs will produce leaves and stems that will die back to the ground each year and then we'll kind of go back from that. Um, sometimes we refer to them as broadleaf plants. Um, in the gardening and ornamental worlds, forbs typically means just flowers. Um, and then when we're talking about resources, forbs can be, are, are often people who are sometimes just talking about weeds. I've actually met people who had the misunderstanding that forb was just another term for weeds, like as if forbs was its own family that just covered weeds. So that's one of those misunderstandings that can be out there when you're working in the field with like different kinds of groups, uh, which is why I wanted to choose this picture of some Texas wildflowers to emphasize how diverse the forb family can be. And that makes identifying them and especially trying to identify their life cycle very challenging. So, uh, there are some key differences when we're talking about the how to tell if a plant has, a form specifically has an annual life cycle versus a perennial life cycle. And um, if you're you know, at a garden store buying flowers for your yard, usually it says right there, if it's annual or perennial, there's a lot of guidance online about gardening, planting, ornamental, landscaping with annual versus perennial flowers. But for those of us working on the rangelands or in more sort of natural settings, it can be a little bit more complicated. Um, so here, I wanna show you this image um, shows the difference of some of the mean, a, visual, a visualization of some of the like mean rooting depths of plants. If you're looking at it from left to right, the left is where you'll see some of those annual species. And then as we go right, that center plant in the flower, it would be a perennial for going to a, to a, like a dwarf shrub to a typical shrub. So you can see the difference in those rooting depths how that life cycle affects root development and the size and development of the roots has a big impact on that below ground ecosystem 
that is the soils. So uh, perennials, perennials are typically zone specific. We don't often see plants that we would categorize as invasive um, or non-native in the perennial family because they are typically only grow in their areas. Perennials have a, very, a typical predictable growth season. And then even if conditions are right, they won't bloom outside of that season. Annuals can be found on a wide variety of different environments. Uh, for example, annual broom breed can be found in all 10 ecoregions in Texas. Annuals, as opposed to perennials, are really like opportunists. They will bloom as soon as they have the resources available. So if they have the minimum soil temperature and soil moisture and adequate light that they need, you could see them blooming, you know, end of February, early March. They won't, they don't need to wait. If they have the resources that they need, they're just gonna go for it. So talking about looking at a plant and, and trying to tell the difference if it's an annual perennial, it can get pretty complicated because um, it, it, you can't rely on something as simple as, well, perennials live longer, so they grow bigger. That's not really how it works, um, unfortunately. Annual forbs only produce by seed, so that allows them to survive long periods of unfavorable circumstances, like extended periods of drought, intense heat waves, frost periods. Um, that seed reproduction can even protect them from things like mowing and grazing. So you can see with these sort of defense mechanisms that if you have an annual that you're trying to manage, perhaps to decrease its population, it can get very challenging. Uh, there is even some research that's shown that there are plant species that have evolved from perennial to annual life cycles because it was beneficial for them. Uh, so some things that you can look for in your pastures, in your fields, to see if you can tell if a plant is annual or not, a lot of it is going to be based on time. Um, as soon as you observe those plants germinate and emerge, if it happens just as soon as the warm temperatures occur, then you might be looking at an annual. If you see them sort of like start growing in spring and carry on all the way through, there's a warm, warm season, whenever your summer to summer, spring ends in your area, you might be looking at an annual. Um, conversely, if you're looking at the different life cycle, if the species emerges in the fall, then, and that's the only time of year, then that might be a winter annual. The, uh, the plants can bloom at different times every year. And like the perennials, if you notice like with this stand, this year, you know, it all headed out in March, but last year it didn't come till April. And the year before that, it was even later. So that's probably an annual community. Um, because of their reproductive cycles, they can suddenly occur in a very high density in places that you've never seen them before. And because they only live for one year and they're highly dependent on those resources that exist in the first, few inches of soil, their heights can, and the amount of, pro, of leaf production can vary highly from year to year. Another thing that's pretty typical that you can see in this picture is that annual plants will often form rosettes or basal structures very close to the ground. And instead of moving upward and growing high, they'll actually spread out and they can actually create a pretty hard mat along the soil surface. If you go to pull them out, the root system is typically shallow and much easier to remove uh, than something that's perennial. I think we've all experienced trying to weed something that's perennial and you pull it out and you could just see that you didn't even get, you didn't get anything of the root system out. Um, so we're talking about some perennial forbs. Uh, you're probably dealing with perennials if you see the same plant in the same area, probably without a change, a significant or dramatic change in their distribution from year to year, size-wise, they're going to produce more leaves and more stems than an annual plant. And you'll actually see the leaves and stems will reemerge from the same crown for more than two years. Um, the leaf production and the plant height are typically consistent from year to year. And um, forbs will usually have a long tap root. And if you're, you know, kind of getting in there, touching the plant, trying to um, identify a difference, something you can look for is dig a little under the surface and find like creeping root structures such as stolons or rhizomes. And you can see like a, what those would look like in picture, rhizomes are usually underground, stolons are usually above ground. So if you're finding those, then you're probably dealing with a perennial plant, a perennial forb. And I think I just hit it and I said questions, but then I will, I'll let Megan kind of handle that. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Maddie. That really was great. It's a great introduction to the, the kind of Ford family and the differences we might see out on the landscape. I'll turn it over to you, Tim. All right, thanks, Megan. Thanks, Kelly. Next up for our next speaker, we have Sam Kiesnick. Uh, Sam Kiesnick is an urban wildlife biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And here he's able to speak to us about the family breakdown, which will be taking an unknown plant down to family. Sam serves as the east side of the DFW Metroplex. He previously worked as a nature educator with the city of Mansfield at Oliver Nature Park, as a naturalist at the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge, as a science interpreter with the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, as a botanist with the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, and as an instructor at Weatherford College. He has a master's degree from Charleston State University studying the genetics of pocket gophers, and as an urban wildlife biologist, Sam's focus will be on the three A's, awareness, appreciation, and action. All right, Sam, take it away. Okay, excellent. And you can hear me all right, uh, Tim, Megan? You sound amazing. Oh, <laughs> Tim, stop that, please. We're in front of people. Um, so I am going to set my alarm real quick for 14 minutes so I do not get yelled at. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you all hear that and see that all right? Hopefully. Looking, so. looking good, yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into um, the names of plants, and we're going to talk about the families of plants. And I don't know how many of you watched this show, but it was a great show that talked about the different relationships that exist within a family. The same sort of thing happens with plants, where we have related plants that have related characteristics. So why do we want to try to learn the plant families? Well, so we can get to know what they're related to and how these different species that are in the same family have some of those similar characteristics. Um, I love tossing around some Latin words because it makes you sound a little bit smarter. So I give you all permission on behalf of the state, I give you permission to use some of these Latin words in either your own internal conversations or as you converse with others. And whenever we see that uh, suffix ACA or ACE, depending on who you talk to, that means the plant family of. So in the case of rosaceae, that's the plant family of rosa, or poaceae, that's the plant family of poa. And both rosa and poa, those are uh, genera or the genus of a type genus. So whenever you see that ACA or ACA, depending on who you talk to, that just means the plant family of. So let's try to incorporate that into are annoying conversations. Families can change. So as we learn some of these plant families, recognize that we're learning what they are today. Tomorrow, they may be called something different. And some of you that have taken plant taxonomy or uh, plant identification courses, you may have learned of names like graminae or umbiliferae or cruciferae. Well, these have been changed to have that Latin suffix of AC. So the graminae is now called poaceae. Umbiliferae is now called APAC. And I also want to get something off the top here, too. The plants don't really care what we call them. They don't care what we call them. But we like to give them names to help with our own understanding of them. Some of our plant families have been butchered and split up and chopped up into lots of other plant families. Uh, Liliaceae has been split into a whole slew of different families. Um, other ones like um, Scrofulariaceae, the scroffs, those have been just broken up into lots of different families. And names also change for our plants. A great example of this is the Texas mountain laurel. Maybe you've been seeing or smelling some of these. Lately, to me, it has that grape soda smell, those blooms. Well, um, you may have learned this as Sephora secundiflora. Now there's the new name for it, Dermatophyllum secundiflora. And I hope that you're still hearing me all right. I've got a low system resources on there. So hopefully you're still hearing me 
Okay. You may be frustrated by some of these name changes, but I get excited by it. It tells me that our knowledge has changed. So something within us, our knowledge has changed a little bit. So we reflect that change with a name change. So let's get excited that taxonomy is not a stagnant science. Now let's look at the reproductive structures and it's okay to stare at these with plants. So with the reproductive structures, we're looking at things like the flowers, the fruits. So these are important for uh, the different plant families. Different plant families typically have similar reproductive structures. So look closely at these structures and it can help you on what plant family it is. In the case of our mints or lambiaceae, they have that bilateral symmetry on the uh, flower. It's a beautiful adaptation for the pollinator that comes and rests on that bottom petal. It gets some pollen dusted on its back. It flies over to another flower and that's picked up by the stigma of the female parts. So this is a neat way to see characteristics that families share. You can also look at the fruits of plants, the fruits and the nuts and the seeds of plants. And it's okay to stare at this too. When you're eating something like a ripe peach, you're basically eating a ripened ovary. So that's the, the fruit of that plant. In the case of rosaceae, these are typically droops. So we have that singular seed surrounded by fleshy stuff to get an animal like us to pick it, nibble on it, and then throw the seed, distributing and dispersing that plant. Plant diversity in Texas, Texas is bonkers. It is crazy. And I enjoyed the chat looking at the different corners of Texas that are being represented here. And a lot of you are seeing different types of plants out there. We live in a magnificent state with a lot of different ecoregions based on geography, precipitation, topography, all of these things. Around, give or take, 5,500 species of plants that are native or naturalized in Texas. So that's a lot of names. We, we share the state with a lot of natural neighbors. And there's roughly, give or take, 180 plant families. Lots of diversity, a whole lot of diversity. A great book, if you want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the taxonomy of plants, Botany in a Day is a great, great book. And I'm, I'm going to be using some excerpts from that book to go over a few of our important plant families. 180 of them, give or take. So we're going to look at five. The first one, very, very important, Rosaceae. If you've eaten fruit before, more likely than not, it comes from a rose, the rose family, from this family of Rosaceae. There are some characteristics that they share. Uh, most of them, the wild ones at least, have five petals and five sepals. If you're trying to woo a, a girl or a boy with a rose that you buy from the grocery store or from the florist, you're giving a mutant to that individual. That is a mutant. All of those mini petals, those are modified. We have modified this plant to instead of stamen to produce petals. So if you're trying to woo that person, make sure that he or she is not a botanist because they will just go, ugh, disgusting. Why, how dare you give me that mutant? The wild ones typically have just the five petals. Lots of stamen there, though. That's a characteristic of, of our roses. And the fruits, super, super important. Then we have the poaceae, the grass family, the family of poa. So grasses have the modified flower structure. They don't need to smell good. They don't need to have nectar. They don't need to have a certain shape to entice a pollinator because the wind is doing all the work. 
Instead, they have these modified flowers, and you may even be able to see the dangling stamen or the male parts of our grasses as they're getting pollinated by the wind. Fabaceae, the bean family. This is also sometimes broken up into three subfamilies. If you think of it, um, a Texas blue bonnet, the flower looks a little bit different than a mesquite or a mimosa or a wesatch. Well, it goes into a different subfamily, but the fruits look very, very similar. So they still have the legumes of, of the Fabaceae. You can probably see some of these out blooming right now as some people are reporting Texas blue bonnets that are uh, flourishing and blooming all around members of the bean family Fabaceae. Typically, they have palmate or pinnately compound leaves. So rather than just a simple leaf, they have a lots of leaflets on a rachis or on the stem of that. Asteraceae. This is probably the most complicated plant family. It's so funny that we talk about this one in some of our general plant introduction classes because it is crazy complex. I don't know if you've played that game, she loves me, she loves me not, or he loves me, he loves me not. With that, each time that you're pulling out what you may have called a petal is actually a flower. That's one of the ray flowers. So Asteraceae typically has a composite head of multiple flowers. And each one of those loves me, loves me not things that you pull out has the complete male and female parts. So it's a complete flower. Some of our asters or asteraceae have just discoid head. So it's a lot in the center with no ray flowers. Other ones will have solid ray flowers. So looking closely at some of these sunflowers or daisies or dandelions is important to tell what plant family it is. The composite head means it's in asteraceae. And then we can look at some of our gymnosperms, some of the, the bane of our existence with our mountain cedar or ash juniper. These, the reproductive structures are cones. So the male cones that it actually explode and a lot of that pollen saturates the air. Uh, this is a characteristic of the family to have those cones. Uh, in the case of our junipers, we have the boy plants and the girl plants and the girl plants have these fleshy cones uh, that you can see there that make some interesting uh, drinks perhaps. And then uh, the males have all of those cones that explode to saturate the air with pollen. So that's just a few example of plant families. One of the things that I like about learning the plant families, again, is seeing those shared characteristics. So if you already know the name of a plant, well, maybe learn the name of the family. In this case, I was looking at some yard weeds and I had bed straw or gallium aparini. I had field matter, Sherardia arvensis, and then a tiny bluet, Houstonia pusilla. Each one of these are in the Rubiaceae family, or they share a family. And you can see those similar characteristics in it, the four petals there fused at the base. So trying to find some of these plants, if you already know the name of the, the plant, find the name of the family. And you thought this was just gonna be a fun lecture. No, 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 you have an assignment here. So your assignment, and if you want to, um, you can actually put your pinky up to the screen. And this works if you're watching it recorded too. So put your pinky up. This is a pinky promise that we're doing. We pinky promise that we're gonna find three different uh, plants at lunch. And the extra challenge, try to find three different plant families. So learning the plants, learn the families, and you can get a little bit of a deeper relationship with those organisms. So with that, I'm gonna stop this. I had 30 seconds left to go. Um, so I wasn't yelled at by Tim or Megan this time. Um, anybody have any questions or comments that may be uh, sort of too close to the edge? Yeah, we can, we can grab those questions and comments in the question and answer box. Sam, if you want to check those after this presentation. Cool. Appreciate that. Excellent presentation. You got a pretty good laugh at that. Maybe 
maybe the first plant party shirt will be say no to mutants, <laughs> something like that for the road. We'll see what we can do. So uh, with that, we'll move on to our next speech, speaker and presentation titled The Genus Paspalum in Texas. This will be presented by Dr. Baron Rector. Dr. Rector has worked for the Texas a and Extension Service in College Station for over 40 years. As an extension range specialist based in College Station, he supports county extension programming, conducts applied research, and educates both adults and youth on the importance of proper rangeland management and use of natural resources. Dr. Rector's plant identification skills are truly incredible. We are pleased to have him here today to discuss the family past Palin. With that, Dr. Rector, the floor is yours. So ladies and gentlemen, as, as Tim stated, my name is Baron Rector. Uh, and today I'm bringing you uh, my part of the plant party number six uh, from the SM Tracy Herbarium here at Texas A&M University. Uh, and this is the home of a herbarium uh, that actually began looking at grasses. And in the grass family, uh, the Poaceae, uh, we're going to find out that in Texas, we have about 131 genera, and these things change. And we have uh, information uh, from, on about 668 uh, grasses that occur in the state of Texas, and that is both native and introduced grasses that are out on the rangeland or in the landscape, minus the grasses that are used in uh, lawnscaping and landscaping in general. So the, the thing I want you to know is what I'm following here today is uh, a guideline that comes out of Robert Shaw's book on the Guide to Texas Grasses, uh, printed back in 2012. And so we will proceed on. And uh, ooh, here we go. So my topic is the genus Pasculum in Texas. Who are they and, and the keys to identification? So when I go out, on range land, pasture land, a vacant lot, I see grasses that are members of the Poaceae, but what do I go up, what do I do to go about identifying them specifically? And so plant parts uh, have been a, a major part of the learning in agristology because a lot of times in taxonomy uh, classes at universities, the taxonomy class covers all the families, but keeps the sedges and rushes at, that are grass-like plants and the grasses as separate courses. So in the grass family, there is a whole nother set of terminology that we have to learn to be able to communicate or to be able to do observational identification. So when I think about the pasplum, species in Texas in 1952, B.C. Tharp at the University of Texas in his book, uh, Texas Range Grasses, he reported 33 species in the genus Paspalum for Texas. Now, some of you may have learned that as Paspalum, uh, depending on what part of Texas you're from. And in 1975, the coordinator and curator of the SM Tracy Herbarium, Frank Gould, reported in his book, The Grasses of Texas, that the state had 29 species. So as science moves and we learn how to name things that are related, this number keeps going up and down. Just as our previous speaker said, the number of families of plants is always changing. In the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Bulletin MP1655, printed in 1990, uh, there were 29 species, again, listed in that publication in 1990. In 2012, when Robert Shaw wrote his book on the Guide to Texas Grasses, he showed that we had 32 species in the genus Paspalum. So as Madeline described, in looking at terminology and grouping of plants, 
look at the bottom of this slide and that out of the 32 recognized species today, 21 species are native and 11 species are introduced from other countries of the world. And the plums, the introductions are generally from Central and South America, and a lot of them come out of the country of Brazil. If we look at their longevity, two of the 32 species of Paspalum are annuals, and 30 of them are perennials. And notice that I spell the word perennial right. That's a real hard one to get across. When I look at the time of the year, the seasons that these Paspalums grow, all 32 species are considered to be warm season grasses. They green up in the spring, they grow through the summer and flower, they set seed, and by the end of the fall, they are going dormant for the winter months. So the changes that have occurred from that 1975 period to today and our recordings through 2017 Look at these changes. We had a Paspalum conspersum that was added in 1990. It's an introduced grass. It's a warm season perennial. It's used as a forage species, but it escapes cultivation. And it has persisted in Cameron, Brazoria, and Chambers counties along the Gulf Coast. So we not only are naming new species that we find in Texas, but we're naming the adventive or the plums of the world that become established in the state of Texas. So conspersum is a, is a good example. Paspalum intermedium uh, after 2003 was added to our list and it is noted to be an introduced woody, weedy species that's on roadsides, but it has persisted in one county in Brazoria County. And why would Brazoria County be listed for these first two plants? When I think about where forage research on plants from other countries that would add to our forage base for livestock in the state of Texas, sometimes these have escaped uh, out onto the landscape, whether I'm at La Junta, New Mexico at the Plant Materials Center, I'm at an AgriLife research station that's out in the field, these kind of things happen by what we bring in. Number three, Paspalum modestum was added after 2003. It's from South America. And it is found in only one county today in Refurio County in roadside ditches and swales. So after 2003, the Paspalum fluitans, the name was changed and combined in with two other groupings within Paspalum to become uh, Paspalum repens. And so there is a name change. And then look at number five, Paspalum um, scrobiculatum uh, is a perennial cereal that was introduced from India. It's called India Paspalum. It was known in the rolling plains, but after 30 years, the plant has not persisted as it was being raised as a cereal crop, and it has been dropped from the list of Texas Paspalum today. So this an example of what is happening. So our 32 Paspalums, Paspalum cetaceum, which is a, a grouping of five varieties in this one species, it occurs in 157 of the 254 Texas counties. That is the most widely distributed of all the 32 Paspalums across the state. And then if you look at Dallas grass and thin Paspalum is a native warm season perennial, but the second one in 109 counties is Dallas grass, a grass that has been introduced from South America 
as a forage grass, but now it's become an invading weedy species, uh, and not only in lawns and vacant lots, but it's out in pastures where people never planted it, but it is coming up today. And so look at Harry's seed pass form, 105 counties, not grass, joint grass, 94 counties, uh, the, the invading basy grass in 89 counties, a native Florida pass form that grows all the way from Texas to the East Coast in 82 counties, our native brown seed pass form, which is a co-dominant with little blue stem on the post oak savanna, is in 68 counties of the coastal prairie uh, and the post oak savanna over to the Edwards Plateau. And so Bahia grass, another introduced forage, it's reported. And remember the reporting is from herbarium specimens that exist in the various herbaria in the state of Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, and Missouri, where these specimens have been deposited. Uh, Pasplum langii, rusty seed pasplum, 42 counties. Phil pasplum, 37. Long Tom, um, a dominant down on the coastal prairie, 31 counties. Water pasplum, 29 counties. Seashore pasplum, 22 counties. And then uh, early pasplum, which is a perennial, uh, is in 20 counties. And then Hartwig pasplum in 17 counties. If I knew this list of these counties, that would be a good starting place for me to know what pasplums occur in the county or counties that I work in. So other pasplums, which are even in fewer counties, there's one species in 13 counties, one in 12, three only occur in six Texas counties, one in five counties, all the way down to five species that our reporting uh, shows that they only occur in one county. So B.C. Tharp at the University of Texas wrote this, species of pasplum are also referred to as paspala grasses. Collectively, they are an important factor in ranges, um, the prairies of the coast and in pastures of our forested portion of the interior of Texas. They're typically the hot point for pasplums is in tropical America, uh, down in the bottom of Central and the top of South America. They are typically bunch grasses, uh, but a few produce short rhizomes uh, that will make them look like a semi-sod uh, formation, like Bahia grass does, or common curly mesquite or buffalo grass. And so the members of the genus are abundant in the coastal prairie, the East Texas forest, South Texas, and the post oak savanna. So the pasplums include both annuals or perennials. And this is the um, written English for the Latin that describes the paspalums. Leaf blades are flat. The inflorescence has one to many unilateral spike branches. The spikelets are either in pairs or they're solitary. And that turns out to be a breaking point in a key. The key for the genus is three pages. And it begins uh, in it by looking at, are the spikelets solitary or paired? So the spikate primary unilateral branches, if you look at the picture down at the bottom, that is a unilateral uh, branch of spikelets. And that is Dallas grass, which has two rows that look like they're opposite and then two rows of spikelets in the center that rotate or alternate. So we, we have this in our pattern. So the spice, five species uh, and name varieties for Paspalum uh, cetaceum occur in all the vegetation areas of Texas, except for the Transpacus. So there are characteristics identified in our books that talk about how, how we go about identifying this grass 
from the other pasplums. So look, here is pasplum cetaceum, and notice that the branches are not united together, but are separate, uh, and that the base of the plant at this time of year can have a purple tint in it. And this is how the spikelets are arranged on a raquilla that is very broad, but it also can be winged. So there are many characteristics that go in to describing uh, what a pasplum is. And so I see, Tim, that I've used up my 15 minutes uh, and I would like to look at those questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and it has been a pleasure for me to be a part of the plant party number six. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rector. We appreciate that presentation very much. Um, and we're going to turn this over to Charles for our next presenter. All right, thanks, Megan. <laughs> We're ready to get to our last presentation, and uh, we want to bring back uh, Sam Kishnick, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department urban biologist, uh, going to talk to us about using uh, Seek and iNaturalist for Plan ID. Take it away, awesome. Sam. Okay, thank you so much, Charles. Really appreciate that. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hold on one second, moving this. Okay, and I'm going to set my I'm going to set my alarm as not to get yelled at. Okay, so it's so good to talk to you again. Thank you, Dr. Rector, for that uh, presentation on paspalum, which can be a very challenging grass to identify. But like you said, there are some of those characteristics that are important to look at. Um, so I'm going to talk about iNaturalist. So this is modified down from a three-hour presentation. Uh, and I'm bonkers about iNaturalist. I am so crazy about iNaturalist. Love this tool, but it's also just a tool. It's just a tool to help us engage with nature, to develop that relationship of learning the names of the creatures that we share the planet with. Um, I think it's a beautiful tool. So let's talk about it. I'll also talk about using Seek, another app that uses iNaturalist's visual algorithm. Um, also, another thing to mention real quick, um, I've got my contact list on there too. Um, I'll leave the last slide up for a bit too if you want to um, ask me a question on that. Got some great questions earlier. First of all, what is iNaturalist? Um, I like to tell folks it's kind of like Facebook for nature nerds, um, and I don't want to make it also sound like a cult, but like there are some similarities. Like I really believe in this thing. It has changed my, the way that I go outside uh, on iNaturalist, on the website itself. It says that it's an online social network of people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. It's a database, it's a community. It's a way to go outside and open your eyes a little bit more to the entire ecosystem. And I strongly believe that it's a revolutionary tool. It is a revolutionary tool that we can use to help us learn, but also help us get more um, attached to nature. I use it a lot as an urban wildlife biologist and just so that you know, when you're out making observations, know that those observations are being used. They're being used by biologists, by naturalists, by nature enthusiasts, but also urban biologists to show that not just is there biodiversity, but there's also a constituency of people that need wild spaces. So we use this information. There's an app for that. So yes, there is an app that you can get. It's a free app. Oh, I also need to say um, iNaturalist is a nonprofit organization funded by National Geographic Society and the California Academy of Sciences. It's a global platform. So you can use the app for it, but the real magic happens on the website, iNaturalist.org. That is where you can go and peruse the data. You can see the different paspalum that have been observed in your county. You can look at 
the Beatles of Ukraine. Uh, and yeah, Ukraine is making some observations right now currently. So you can even get this global perspective of where biodiversity exists. Also, what I find really uh, important and meaningful, and I do it sometimes selfishly to help myself learn, is going on and identifying the observations that other people make. So people around the world, throughout Texas, even in your county, wherever you may be, are making observations. You can identify or give some guidance on the observations that others make near you or far away from you. So it's pretty cool. So let's talk real quick about the app. Uh, and this is the part that I lose a lot of folks is you have to log in. So the, the app iNaturalist wants to know that you're a real individual, that you are a person. So it requires a login, which is a username and a password. And I know another password to learn, uh, but it doesn't have to be super complex. You're not going to toss on your social security or any of that sort of sensitive information about you personally. So uh, just there it is. Ideal for wild stuff. And I know that sometimes when someone picks up the app, they go to the zoo or they go to the botanic gardens. And true, you can see a lot of diversity in those places, but iNaturalist isn't really the right tool for those sort of locations. It uses the camera built in on your phone uh, and the GPS of your device. And this is an important thing to mention that if you're making observations on private property, or if you're making observations that you don't really want to share with everyone the exact location, you can change the geo privacy. So locations can be exact or open. Whenever I'm at a public park, I leave all of mine at open because I want to know and I want the public land managers to know exactly where these critters are. If you're on private land or if you don't want to share that exact information, you can change it to obscured. And obscured for all intents and purposes, it's basically like a county record. It randomizes that dot so they don't know don't know exactly where that was found. You can also make it private, although real quick with private, if you make your observations with that geo um, accuracy, we don't know if you're looking at stuff from Madagascar, stuff from Antarctica, or stuff from Abilene. So um, just be cautious if you're using private because you may not get a bunch of feedback from it. So this is probably the most important part of, of iNaturalist is for that feedback loop. It's only as good as the evidence that you provide. In other words, if you put kind of a crummy picture or a blurry picture of something, well, your identifications that you get either by the system or by other users may not be very accurate. If you provide pretty crisp, clear photos, um, whenever I'm out in the field, I will bring my hands with me and with my hands, I have a built-in scale, but I also have something to put behind the paspalum inflorescence or behind the little blade of grass that I'm looking at. I have something to help the camera focus on. If you're able to crop, so using the camera on your phone to take a picture and then crop it, that's super, super helpful uh, with identifications. And plants are so chill. I, I really like plants. I mean, I love plants. Plants sort of stay put. They don't mind if you sneak up on them. And you can be pretty loud when you get close to a plant. It doesn't care. You know, it's different than like a bird or a squirrel or a lizard. It's like they can hear the camera sh uh, shutter. So you got to get quick pictures on, on those. But with plants, they're so chill. They will just stay put while we can take pictures of the various different parts. So whenever I'm using this tool, especially in the case of a plant, I will take multiple pictures. So there's that little icon that adds extra pictures if you're using the app or the website for it. Take pictures of the fruits, of the leaves. And it's kind of funny, Dr. Rector talked about the keys for some of these plants. To tell some species, you have to know if it has hairs that are three millimeters under the abaxial surface of the bottom vein of the lower leaf to see which species it is. 
I know how those keys are. They're, they're pretty bonkers. So trying to get multiple pictures of the different angles of the overall growth habit, that definitely helps with your identification. This part is mind blowing to me. I mean, it's just mind blowing. So there is a visual algorithm that the app and the website uses for, for iNaturalist. So I will take a picture of something. I'll try to get, again, a close up of the flower or the fruit or the leaves. I will click on the view suggestions, and then it takes the image, the pixels of that image, the location of where I'm seeing it, and it gives me suggestions of, of what it might be. The key word here is suggestions. In this case, I was looking at this lovely uh, vining plant there at my office at Cedar Hill State Park. I asked the, the computer, I asked the iNaturalist algorithm, what did you see? And what did you see on there? I click it and it pops out some suggestions. The number one suggestion aha, is campsus or trumpet vine. And it nailed it. But if I scroll down of the suggestions, one of them is poison oak. And I say, wow, this computer is so stupid. But if I look at my picture, I can see where the leaves of three or the leaflets of three are shown. So recognize that this is giving just suggestions. This is the beauty of iNaturalist is the community. And it's fellow naturalist, biologist, nature enthusiast around the world. And one of the, the comments earlier asked, well, how do I know if I'm right? If I'm going out looking for plants and trying to find their families, how do I even know if I'm saying the right name or the right family? With iNaturalist, there is the community that exists that help you or help others with the identifications or guidance, or maybe next time get a picture of the underside of that leaf to see the hairs on the abaxial surface or whatever it might be. You can tag users. And I'll just give this as, a, as an offering too. Um, my username on iNaturalist is Sam Biology. You can tag me on there and it makes me happy. So I will look at my dashboard and I'll see the people that tag me on observations. So if you're struggling with one, you can tag some of the fellow users in your area to maybe give you guidance on what that plant or bug or track or whatever it might be. And when you get identifications, double check them. Either double check the visual algorithm or double check the identifications that people give you. And consciously or subconsciously, you are learning in that process. You are learning in that process of double checking. Each observation is a data point. So if you make your observations either open or obscured with your location information, that is putting a dot on the map. It is a photo voucher of where that species is in space and in time. So when I'm out looking at a paspalum in my backyard, I'll see that that's um, paspalum. Oh boy, can I think of a paspalum servii? Okay, so maybe that's paspalum servii. Take a picture of that and I can look on the map and, and see where that paspalum is in relation to all of the other paspalum observations. So each point is a photo voucher of where that species exists. So now let's look at Seek real quick. Uh, Seek was made primarily for kids, but anyone can use it, totally. Anyone can, we can all use this tool. You don't get any um, data points from, from using Seek, so you're not contributing anything to the overall biodiversity information, but you're still getting some good knowledge out of it. So Seek, you can download this. You don't need to put in any sort of password or login or any of that information. It uses a camera feature where you basically just wave it in front of the plant or animal or bug or whatever, and it, it automatically pops out some suggestions of what it might be. It does take some practice, so you may have to grab the plant and help your phone focus in on it. It's gamified a little bit, so you can get different badges and little awards and little prizes for the different plants that you see and all that sort of stuff. 
but it's just another tool that we can use to help us with this identification process. So I'm, I'm still remembering the feeling of that pinky promise. Again, this is a serious thing. You know, there's been wars that have been waged on broken pinky promises. So while we're looking at those plants outside during lunch or whenever, try to find different plants. And if you want to, use iNaturalist and observe those different plants. So make an observation of those three different plants, hopefully of three different families. Toss, toss them on iNaturalist if you want to. You can tag me at Sam Biology anywhere on the observation, on the comments, on the notes, wherever you can tag me there. And I can take a look at it and, and smile. And with that, um, that's all the time that I have. So thank you so much. I hope you get a chance to practice a little bit with this tool. It's a great way to engage with nature. All right, thanks Sam for a great and informative presentation on Plan ID. I'd also like to give thanks again to our door prize sponsors, Bamert Seed, Bear Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, Douglas King Seed, Native American Seed, Pogue Agri Partners, Renewable Resources Extension Act, Texas Brigades, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Thanks again to our speakers and to you for attending our sixth Plant Party webinar. Again, Plant Party is a quarterly advanced plant webinar training series brought to you by USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and sponsored by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. We'll be sending a link to a short survey by email, or you can type in the address you see there on your screen and chat box or we'll pop up the QR code that you can simply hold your phone camera over and click on the link that pops up. As a thank you for filling out the, incre the incredibly short survey at the end of the plant party, your phone number from the survey will be entered into a randomized drawing for an additional plant party cooler and two journal books. So there's three more chances to win simply by completing the survey. The next plant party will be June 15th with the theme of medicin medicinal and edible plants. So bring your appetite. We'll send an email with more information to all the past registrants.